Good morning. Welcome to today's lecture for Tuesday, March 24th. This one is on theatrical space. So as you no doubt remember me saying in many lectures throughout the semester, the play script gives us only part of our theatrical experience. And if you think all the way back to our first class discussion when we were talking about what do you need to have live theater, one of those three key elements was a space wherein the performers and the audience could be at the same time. So how does the kind of space we meet in impact a production or a performance? Space is going to impact not only this actor-audience relationship, but also choices made by the actors, the directors, and the designers in this space. What do I mean by that? Well, the kind of space we're in is going to impact the blocking, which if you remember from last lecture, is the movement of actors within a theatrical space during a scene. It's going to impact the kind of choices designers make, particularly scene designers, um, but also other designers as well. And it is going to impact the kind of acting style and acting choices that actors make. Right. At its simplest, you're going to make different choices if you're in a very small space and people are close to you versus if you're in a very large space and people are far away. One of the most important factors in any theatrical space is that the artists want to be in control of where the audience should be looking at any given moment, what they should be seeing and where they should be focusing their attention and space. It can help us with this. So let's start with the arena space, which is also sometimes called theater in the round, which is kind of cute because this photo image that I have here is actually of a rectangle, but it doesn't matter. An arena space or theater in the round is when the performance space is surrounded by audience on all sides. So if your performance space is a rectangle or a square, that means audience on all four sides. If it's a circle, that means audience all the way around. If you think about our own campus, we actually have a very small arena space right in the center of campus in between Canisius Hall and Donnarumma Hall. And if we were meeting in a regular class session, this would be kind of an on-campus field trip day. And I would take you to that little arena space in between those two buildings and we would experience the space together. Alas, we cannot, so we will do our best to imagine ourselves there. And the arena space is really the oldest theatrical space there is because it is a real natural human desire to kind of cluster around somebody or something that is holding our attention. So this image is of people sitting around a campfire, which certainly in you know the, the deep past of prehistory would be a way for people to gather in the evening and would share the events that happened during their day and people would tell a story and people would gather around and listen. But this carries on even today. You know, if you have ever been a preschooler or grammar school kid on a playground um, and if somebody yells like, oh my God, I found a bug or, oh my God, they're having a fight or, oh my God, someone's throwing up or, oh my God, I just got the new Bakugan or whatever the toy of the moment is, right? Everyone is going to kind of naturally form a circle around whatever the item or object or person of interest is, and they're all going to want to get a better look. So the arena space for a stage is really just uh, turning into architecture, our own natural human instinct to gather in a circle. So there we are, right? It's just a real natural human instinct to cluster like this. And there's kind of something powerful about gathering in a circle like this, right? When you're in a circle, everyone is focused in. So everybody can see what's going on in the middle of the circle. Or if, you know, the participant is within the circle itself, you can see whoever's talking or whoever's doing anything. So it's really easy to keep our attention on what's going on inside that circle and really easy to shut the absolute rest of the world out. 
so this arrangement and this really sort of concentrated focusing of our intention can really create almost a mystical experience. There's an energy in the round. So I have this photograph of um, a football stadium, which is another kind of an arena space, although they're not performing theater, obviously they're performing sports. But I'm sure any of you that have, a, have ever been to a sports event, um, I'm sure you've been in this situation where somebody has started a wave, right? And you've probably participated in it. And that wave can sometimes go around the stadium three, four, five, six times um, nonstop. I like to think of the wave as a way to kind of transmit some of that built up energy that comes from being in this circle arrangement, you know? Um, I once went to a rally with um, the two guys from Mythbusters on the Discovery Channel, and we were all lined up facing the same way towards a stage at one end of the park. And they did a wave from front to back, and that kind of worked. And they did a wave from back to front, and that kind of worked. And then they tried to get a wave going you know, from front to back and then back to front, and it totally didn't work because we just completely lost our focus. Um, but in the round, you can keep it going up for quite a while. It's important to remember when we are talking about arenas as a theatrical space, arenas can be quite big. You know, here's a Roman Colosseum that could hold thousands, but they can also be quite small. There's maybe 75, 80 people here, and they're quite close to the stage, or of course, in between. And as I said at the top of the lecture, arena spaces don't even have to be round. Although we do like to call it theater in the round because the audience surrounds the stage. So this kind of actor-audience relationship does mean that actors have to make certain adjustments to how they are going to perform. So some things that an actor is gonna to have to consider. They're gonna to have to move their body around in space so that each section of the audience gets to see their face on a regular basis. You don't want to spend money on a theater ticket and then have most of your evening spent with the actors back towards you. So the actors have to make sure that as they move about the space, right, and the director, this is part of their kind of coaching that blocking and the stage composition is going to have to make sure as well that as the actors interact, they are making sure that different sections of the audience get to see their face all the time. Another thing to remember is that when your back is to someone, it's very hard for them to understand your words, even if you're speaking clearly. We pick up a lot of cues from watching people's lips move and watching their bodies. So it is really important that we see the face, even if the acoustics are good. Right, we call that projecting, speaking loudly and clearly enough in a way so that you are intentionally making sure that you are heard. Audience members are going to have to make certain adjustments to their expectations as well. Probably one of the main ones is that when you're in an arena space, you are going to probably be able to see audience members kind of across the acting space looking back towards you. And you're going to have to kind of block them out subconsciously while you're focused on the play and kind of willingly pretend that they're not there for the duration. The audience is also going to have to work a little bit harder at that willing suspension of disbelief in order to kind of create the physical world of the play in their minds. Because when you are in the round or in an arena space, the scenery has to be adjusted as well. But on the plus side, since it's easy to shut the world out, it's very easy to build up emotional intimacy with what is going on on the stage because even the seats furthest away from the center are still pretty close comparatively. If you put 100 people in a circle versus 100 people in rows, the back seat in the circle arrangement is going to be physically closer than the back seat in 10 rows of people. And that physical closeness can 
help to foster an emotional closeness. So it can be easier if you can, you know, choose to forget about the audience sitting across the way looking back at you. It can be easier for you to build up empathy for what's going on. So how do those designers adjust to this arena space? Well, they have to kind of sketch in what the world of the play is without really creating it in full. So design choices are going to have to be a bit more presentational and a little bit less representational, at least on the scenery end of things. Because we're dealing with that art as abstraction thing, this is all about selectivity. Which details are we going to choose to put in our design and which details we're going to leave out? So there are certain things that we can't do with set design in an arena space. And that means certain elements are gonna to have to get de-emphasized and other elements are gonna to have to get emphasized. For example, you're not gonna have very much in the way of scenery in an arena space which means costumes and lighting are going to become that much more important. You are also not going to have much in the way of furniture or big, tall set pieces. So the floor and the things that the actors carry on stage with them, like props, are also going to be more important. So, here they've kind of recreated a realistic interior with the furniture pieces and the floor treatment. And then they've done that kind of like old fashioned wainscoting, but only up about halfway. And then the rest of the wall is, you know, invisible, non-existent. And the audience just has to kind of fill that in, in their imaginations. But look at how carefully that floor has been painted and how carefully those, you know, kind of half walls have been paint painted and the careful selection that's gone on with those furniture pieces and costume pieces. Or you might just kind of react, reject realism altogether and just kind of go with some moody lighting and let the actor and their movement on stage kind of tell us where we are. Moving on, we come next to uh, thrust arrangement. Sometimes this is called a three-sided thrust because as you can see that the stage kind of thrusts out into an audience and you have seating basically on three sides if this were a square or a rectangle. And that fourth side, instead of being surrounded by audience, becomes your backstage or your back wall. This is the ruins of the theater at Epidaurus in Greece. Um, you can kind of see, given this arrangement, how naturally we shifted from arena to three-sided thrust. This was built into the side of a hill. I've got a video to show to you after we finish this lecture where you can explore this space a little bit more. But you can see where those kind of platform rectangle things are in the background there. There had been a building there that was you know, two to three stories high, and the actors would stand in front of it and that kind of circle area was the performance space. And then all around them was the seating for the audience. So as you can see, it was quite large. And we credit the ancient Greeks with kind of inventing the three-sided thrust space. Thrust was also very popular in Europe in the Renaissance. This is a reconstruction of Shakespeare's globe. After this lecture, I have an interactive um, virtual tour that I want you to do of the globe where you can kind of get a better sensation of what this space felt like. But as you can see, they've got a raised stage with kind of a platform where actors are standing on it and then on the ground in front of them and on the sides and then further back in seats along the walls on all three sides, you've got audience looking in. And thrust stages are still popular today. This is a contemporary performance space and you can see the shape of the stage there on the left hand side of the of the screen here. You've got, you know, kind of a, a tongue of stage that projects out into the audience and then that back wall with that giant picture frame on it. So what do arena and thrust have in common and how are they different? 
Well, for the actors, they get a little bit of a break because they're dealing with, you know, 270 degrees of audience instead of 360 degrees. So they don't have to be turning in all directions, but they do have to do what we call kind of cheating out to get the audience's attention on all three sides, right? But they get to be a little bit more grounded in a space because you can have one kind of side of your acting space that's going to be, quote, the back. And with audiences, again, they're going to have that, you know, audience on three sides. So you might be looking at someone across the way. You've kind of lost that mystical energy quality that an arena might impose on an audience. But still, on the whole, it's pretty intimate. And you can be pretty close to the action about what's going on. But you don't have to do quite as much work in terms of filling in the physical world of the play in your imagination. Because we get to have a little bit more scenery in a three-sided thrust space. Makes sense, right? Because you have that one side of the stage where there is no audience, and that can become you know, a place to showcase design elements. So you can get pretty realistic. Here's a three-sided thrust space. You can see two of the three sides of the audience there. Those kind of um, what look like long benches on either side here. And then you've got that stage coming out in between. But at the back, right, what we would call upstage, they've got a full, you know, floor to ceiling wall that's got windows and curtains and roof beams and molding and stonework and all kinds of furniture. So it can be very, very detailed on that one side. But notice how as the set moves forward, the scene design becomes more and more sparse. It becomes lower, it becomes smaller, it becomes more scattered, right? There's more space. Here's another example. Again, you can see most of the vertical scenic elements, the big massive trees are way upstage against that back wall. And then the further out into the audience you go, the simpler the set design becomes. You can see that floor is still getting a lot of special attention and the costumes are still you know, kind of key to drawing the eye and filling in the rest of the picture. Here's another example. This set design has, you know, a whole bunch of staircases and different platforms so people can be at different heights. Obviously, the further upstage you go, the higher you can be. The further downstage you go, the lower you have to be so you're not blocking other people's view. Check this out, though. It's kind of presentational, right? You can see the painting of the skeleton, the, the pelvis and the femur on the right-hand side there and what looks like an eyeball on the left-hand side. Doesn't have to be realistic. Here's another one, right? Same idea, fairly realistic interior at this kind of crazy catty corny angle um, and the bulk of the vertical interest is upstage. And here's another set in three-sided thrust. This one is quite presentational and symbolic in terms of its style. For some reason, they have turned the stage into a giant board game or kind of like mashup of several different kind of board games. Again, big visual interest is on that back wall and on the floor. And one more, you get the picture. So three-sided thrust was the norm in ancient Greece and then also in Renaissance Europe. Why is it that we don't see more of these kinds of spaces today? Well, we can thank the Italians um, and the opera. In the 1700s, they developed a new kind of theatrical space that most of us are familiar with today because it also turns out to be a really good space to show movies in. So we have the proscenium house. In a proscenium theater, the audience is in rows, all facing the same direction towards the stage, which is at one end of the room. In some fancy Theaters, you might see seating on the two sides as well, but those tend to be for more expensive tickets. Um, in the Italian era of opera, 
the very, very wealthy and aristocratic used to pay for those seats so that they could have greater privacy, kind of be held away from the riffraff of the cheap seats, and also so that they could be seen as much as the actors on stage. For our purposes, when we're talking about proscenium, we're talking about audience all facing the same direction towards that stage. And one of the big architectural features of a proscenium stage is what we call the proscenium arch, which is this architectural frame that goes across the top and down the two sides of the edge of the stage so that you're literally enclosing the acting space inside and behind a frame. In some theaters, this can be quite elaborate and beautiful and, you know, gilded just like a picture frame in a museum. And in other spaces, this can be quite plain, just squared off concrete. And as you can see, you know, right behind that proscenium arch is where you have your curtain that can come up and down when you want to close the curtains. It's really hard to close the curtains in a three-sided thrust and impossible really to do it in an arena. But proscenium is where you get that curtain. What's important to remember with this is that on either side to the left and the right of that picture frame is a whole big empty space. So you're only seeing about like one third of the stage um, when you're looking through that picture frame. We'll talk about why that's important in a moment. All right, so comparing proscenium thrusts, what do they have in common and how do they differ? Whereas thrust and arena are pretty similar to each other, there's a big difference between arena and proscenium and even thrust and proscenium, right? The architecture is significantly different. The audience is arranged in a very different way. And this creates different advantages and challenges for both the performers and the designers and the audience. So how do the actors adjust? Well, now they've only got audience on one side instead of three sides or all sides, which means the actors need to primarily face out, right? Think now, if we were here together, I would take us to the Kelly stage and I have two people stand on the Kelly stage while everybody was else in the audience and have them carry on a conversation. So try to picture this, right? But when two people are in conversation or more, right, they tend to be facing each other. They might get close to each other and, you know, chit chat amongst themselves. But if you've got 500 people staring at you and they're all coming in one direction, you really need to turn both your bodies out in such a way so that the audience can see you and hear you. Because if you're not facing them, it's hard for them to see and hear you. So actors have to do what we call cheating out, which means kind of doing with their body what Egyptian hieroglyphs did, you know, kind of showing the audience the most of their body while still giving the appearance of talking to the person next to them on stage, right? This is a not very natural way to stand and talk to someone. So this is going to be a little bit more presentational in the acting style, a little bit more stylized, right? And because the performers are within and behind this giant picture frame, and because when the audience is lined up in rows, the back seats are going to be a lot more far away physically than the back row of an arena, even if it was a big arena, right? The actors are going to have to make bigger gestures and bolder gestures, and they're going to have to project even more. I mean, today we're all enhanced with microphones and sound systems, but um, they still have to project. And they really need to make sure that their movement and their gestures and their words are carrying uh, to the back. So it can be really easy for an audience to kind of not feel connected to what's going on on stage because it's like looking at a moving picture. It's like looking at a movie or at something on TV through a screen, right? And it's really easy to lose that sense of live. So this is work on the actor's part and work on the audience's part to really kind of stay engaged and focused. Now, if you're in the audience, where you're sitting is going to matter a whole lot more than if you were in an arena or in a three-sided thrust. Because, you know, if you're too close, 
then it's kind of like craning your neck if you're in the front seat in a movie theater. If you're too far away, you're going to miss details and you might not be able to hear as well. If you're sitting directly behind someone who's taller than you or has a big hat or someone who moves around a lot, they're going to keep blocking your view. So it's easy to become distracted. you got to really work a little bit harder to stay engaged. But what you definitely don't have to do as an audience member is try to kind of recreate in your imagination the physical and visual world of the play all that much. This is something that proscenium theaters allow for designers to do for us. Because within that proscenium arch, you can basically kind of create, you know, a millionaire's version of a diorama from third grade science projects, right? You can put all kinds of elaborate scenery inside that proscenium arch, whether it's a single set or if you have multiple sets. Because remember, I told you about on either side of that arch behind the wall, you've got big empty spaces. So what that means is you could have like three stage sized sets on at any time. You close the curtain, you move one set out, you bring another set in, you open the curtain and it's a whole new vista. So you can have very, very elaborate scenery. You can have huge crowds of people, right? Cause they can be off to one side. We call these sides that are hidden behind the wall, the wings of the theater, right? So you can have people waiting in the wings and scenery waiting in the wings to go on. For example, I believe this is an opera and I can't remember what the opera is, but it is um, drawings from a set designer. It is the same show in the same theater, that kind of diagonal castle -y shape around it is the proscenium arch and within it are all the different vistas they are imagining for different scenes. Here's another, you know, much plainer, um, set design for a proscenium house, but you can still see, right? The You can have vertical walls, you can have really elaborate painted scenery, you can have big items of scenery, you can have stuff all over the place. Zooming out from the audience, right, you can see this is a production of The Lion King and they're showing you how it is performed on stage. So you can have, you know, big crowds of dancers where the dancer's body and their costume is, you know, taking up twice the space as one normally would because they're a giraffe or an antelope or an elephant. You can see here's another proscenium stage and you've got two to three stories of scenery built there. So you can have kind of multiple areas of interest happening at any given time. You can really fill this space up. And here is another show that is done where they're really kind of accentuating this idea of the picture frame. They've really turned that proscenium arch into a literal picture frame and then reinforced it with some of the scenery there. And then notice they've got kind of a painted backdrop at the very back that's giving the impression of a much bigger space and actors kind of standing in front of it. So this is a very presentational style in a proscenium stage. But wait, there's more. Those are the major three, theatrical architectures, arena, three-sided thrust, and proscenium. In the 20th century, especially on college campuses and high schools, we have come to love a kind of space called the black box. And that is literally what it means. It's usually a rectangle or a square space that is painted black and it is featureless as possible so that it can be reinvented and rearranged and reused over and over again. It has no real built-in architecture. The seating is not permanent. There's no permanent platform. There's no proscenium arch. You can arrange the space any way you like. Put actors and audience in any configuration that you like. You're only constrained by your budget and your imagination. So colleges really love this because that allows them maximum flexibility for minimum um, investment. Um, and small theater companies love it too, because certain plays are going to lend themselves to different kinds of architectures. And you're going to want different kinds of arrangements or different kinds of plays. And of course, there's lots more ways to arrange an audience than either in a circle or on three sides or all facing one way. You can set it up like a tennis court with the audience on two sides. There's all different ways you can arrange it. And a black box allows you to do that. 
But we don't even need a literal theater in order to perform theater. We could go outside or we could repurpose another space and turn it into a theater. We call these instances either environmental space or found space. And really it's kind of wide open. It's just any space that wasn't designed to be a theater that we turn into one. So two questions, why the heck would we wanna do that? And how do the actors, the audience and the designers adjust in these spaces? Well, sometimes, you know, you don't have a space of your own and you don't have a big budget, but there is another space that really kind of fits what you're looking for. So use it. You know, if you're doing a Midsummer Night's Dream and you want a beautiful enchanted forest and there is this beautiful park that's got lots of trees in it and you can rent it, then go for it. Now you don't need to build a whole bunch of fake trees, right? Or if you want to, you know, have your show set in a spooky mansion and there's a spooky mansion nearby, you're golden. So sometimes this can be really kind of helpful and, and creative. But that doesn't mean it's going to be perfect, right? Think about what is involved when using a non-traditional theater space for a theater. I have no idea who these people are or what this play is, but obviously it has something to do with Star Trek. But it's outside. So they've got very, very little in ways of scenery. They've got, you know, a couple of chairs. They've got a doorway. It looks like they've got audience on two sides. But they've even kind of imagined, you know, like the computer keyboards and all of the other stuff that one would expect to see in the Starship Enterprise. So again, you're back to that audience trying to fill in what the reality is. Here, the costumes are really what's creating the world for us, telling us who these people are and where they are. And as you can see, right, you're, the actors are facing towards us and we're looking at them, but beyond them, we can see the audience on the other side. So we've got that distraction again. But if we were in a theater, at least we would know we'd be surrounded by people who were there to see a show. Here we seem to be out in a park. So, you know, anybody could kind of wander through this or behind this at any given moment and be a distraction. We're also rather at the mercy of the weather or traffic sounds or construction noise or anything else that's going on out in Mother Nature and or civilization. This is a performance that is being held in a building that had been a church and they're going to now use as a theater. Um, I believe this is just a rehearsal. So imagine where those dancers are sitting, you would have audience, right? So you're going to have to kind of improvise a few things when you're using a found space as your theater. It's probably not going to be set up with a fantastic sound system or state-of-the-art lighting equipment that's meant to illuminate an actor and downplay the audience. So you're going to have to compensate for that. You're not necessarily going to have super comfy seating for your audience. You're going to have to figure that bit out. And it might not be great climate-wise, right? It might be cold and damp. It might be hot and stuffy. You know, theaters especially in the 20th and 21st century, we've really designed them for maximum audience comfort. Um, and this might not allow. And in this day and age of accessibility and compliance, you know, theaters are designed to be accessible to as many patrons of all uh, physical abilities. Um, when you're using a found space, you have to be aware of like, well, what if somebody needs a wheelchair? Or what if somebody is hearing impaired? Or what if somebody needs some other kind of assistance? Here's a performance that's taking place in front of an abandoned building. And so you've got, you know, kind of exactly the right tone, but obviously they had to be very careful to make sure that it was going to be safe for the actors and safe for the audience. Of course, you can even turn your own living room into a theater space for a moment. Then you're dealing with, you know, what if my audience member has to use the bathroom or what have you, right? And you got to be careful about fire codes and people's safety and making sure everything's going to be fine and making sure you want these people in your own personal space. But all that said, using a found space can be quite inspiring. It can be just the thing that you need to make your production work.